In Romania there's a popular saying, Romania only has two peaceful neighbors, Serbia and the Black Sea. When it comes to Balkan countries, Romania and Serbia have a rather special relationship. Unlike many countries that we've talked about in this series, who have a raging bro boner for each other, the bromance between Romania and Serbia in contrast is a bit different and milder in nature as their relationship stems from the fact that they may be the two of the only neighboring countries in the Balkans to never have had their states declare war on one another, nor participate in their own volition in an armed conflict against each other, which for the Balkans indeed is a great achievement. While due to EU inception, in modern times this affection probably isn't as close as it used to be, nevertheless. Romania and Serbia have still proceeded with a most unbalcony neighborly affection for many hundreds of years. To understand this uniquely non-turbulent relationship, we'll have to go way back. Back to a much simpler time, when we only needed one Subway Surfer clip to hold our attention span. Ryan, are you suggesting that 9-11 didn't change everything? We all know Romania is a bit of a Balkan odd duck, unique due to its ancestry being Latin and its language being in the Romance category, alongside with Spanish, Italian, Portuguese and potentially French, depending on whether or not you consider it a language. <laughs> oh, oui, oui, madame. Madame. <laughs> However, precisely because of this fact, the relationship between the Romanians and the Serbs flourished. After the demise of the Roman Empire, Romania was forcefully weaned off of Rome's tit and cast into a sea of Slavs and Trianon deniers to fend for itself, which made Romania on all sides of the Carpathians surrounded by heavily armed Slavs. Not wanting their culture to get annihilated, their best bet was to play nice and learn to live with their more numerous Slavic neighbors. Therefore, from an early on history, the Romanians and Serbs lived together in relative coexistence. With this mostly peaceful accord came influence. Today, while it is difficult to parse, anywhere from 10 to 20% of Romania's vocabulary is of Slavic origin, largely influenced by the surrounding Serbs, Bulgarians and Ukrainians. However, this ratio used to be higher, potentially as high as 40%, before Romania decided to re-Latinize itself in the 19th century and replace many of its Slavic terminology with Italian and French. Despite the fact that Serbian and Romanian are two very different languages, there has always been a degree of familiarity between their speakers. When trying to learn Romanian, it is still quite noticeable that many words used in everyday conversation have a Slavic origin, such as da, draga, kelnerica, kurvar, jubi, nevastu, rai, and etc. etc. When it comes to religious vocabulary, 25% of it is Slavic loanwords. Thus, because of this influence, a familiarity between the two was established, which would continually sub consciously influence the relationship of the two. Almost as much as hackers can influence your cybersecurity. Which is why you should go and get Atlas VPN, baby! For those of you that don't know, I recently got hacked and my entire channel alongside Instagram, Twitter and personal Facebook account got compromised. <laughs> Just because I thought, hey, I'm at home. Why should I use my VPN? I'm not on a public Wi-Fi network. What's the worst that can happen? So basically what I did, I replaced his bad, low effort content with, with something that can be good for the masses, you know? That's why I highly recommend getting yourself a VPN and actually keeping it on. And with Atlas being the best deal on the market, there's no better VPN for the job. Costing only $1.99 a month, you can avoid being the laughing stock of the internet like me. <laughs> and prevent your login data from being stolen. Besides keeping your search and data private, Atlas also prevents ads and malware from harming your computer. With companies also using different prices based on where you're surfing the web, you can avoid getting charged more money for the same product by turning on Atlas. It's also really handy to switch to an Argentinian IP when buying games off of Steam, just an FYI. You can also access different TV shows and movies, geolocked from your home country. The best part about it is, it's on unlimited devices. So go and click the link in the description and get Atlas Premium for just $1.99 a month, plus 3 months for free. Prices have already risen since our last integration, so better go and get it now before they rise again. 
And if you dislike the service, no problem. You have a 30 day money back guarantee. So go and check it out. Try it and see it for yourself. Again, go to atlasv.pn slash year and protect yourself. Another influence in the relationship between the two was that both Serbia and Romania shared a common geographic threat from the Ottomans, as they were located on a border where the Ottomans were expanding their empire into the Balkans. Consequently, they often cooperated with one another to resist the Ottoman rule that unfortunately engulfed them both in the 16th century. While sometimes they were able to resist via large-scale military means, often this cooperation had to take a more local low-key tone. One of the ways justice could be administered is via the Hajduks, aka bands of outlaws. Hajduks were a direct result of the foreign Ottoman occupation of the Balkans and Central Europe in the late 16th to the mid 19th centuries. Due to the jolly atmosphere created by increased taxes, the stealing of Christian children to be used as soldiers, the decline in regional security and the occasional victory of Christians against Ottoman occupiers, Locals would band together into groups of up to 100 men under one leader and target the rich local Turks either to steal from them or to engage in battles and inflict just punishment. Thus, rich and romantic traditions of these heroes, the Hajduks flourished, similar to the English Robin Hood and his merry men, except that these guerrilla fighters really did exist and stole from the rich unjust foreign occupiers and redistributed their wealth to the local poor, while also drinking rakia and eating raw onions. These Hajduks were able to transcend borders and there are many cases of Serbian and Romanian Hajduks teaming up together. Perhaps the most famous Serbian Hajduk was Starina or Baba Novak. As a teenager he was taken captive by the Turks, who beat him so badly he lost all his teeth, hence the name Starina or Old. After this, he formed his own Hajduk brigade and joined the forces of Prince Mihai Viteazul, or Michael the Brave, who was the first to unite Romania's three principalities and is regarded as one of Romania's greatest national heroes. They joined together in Banat and Novak was made a captain with 2000 Serbian and Romanian Hajduks under his command. He then proceeded to liberate Targoviste, Bucharest, Giurgiu, Sibiu, as well as lands in the south of Banat. Unfortunately, he was double-crossed by a former ally and was given to the Hungarian authorities in Cluj-Napoca and roasted alive slowly over an open flame. Mihai only found out later and raised a flag at the site of his death. Mihai himself was later also betrayed by the same man and assassinated. However, to this day, there are many references for how grateful Romanians were for Baba Novak's help against the Ottomans, such as naming streets and entire neighborhoods after a guy. A statue of him still stands in Cluj, where he was burnt to death. And there are restaurants which managed to be both respectful and delicious, is to honor a man who was grilled to death like a shish kebab. Under the Austro-Hungarian Empire, both peoples were subject to similar treatment. Neither of the two countries especially loved, nor were especially beloved by the empire, and were treated as such. Serbia, because of its potential independence, was seen as a threat to the empire as a strong South Slavic state was theorized to draw other of its Slavic subjects under its influence and disintegrate the empire from within. And Romania, because the Romanians greatly outnumbered the Hungarians in Transylvania. If they were granted autonomy and rights, it was believed they could go against the wishes of the ruling class. Thus, they were treated as second-class citizens, leading to serious local tension, which garnered a mutual understanding between the two, as they were subject to similar oppression by their overlords. With the fall of the Austro-Hungarian Empire after World War I, Romania and Serbia, at this point formerly known as the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes, became nervous about the idea of Hungarian revanchism, meaning the political threat posed by Hungarian nationalism wanted to reclaim its former borders, as well as the prospect of the restoration of the Habsburg monarchy in Austria. So they, along with Czechoslovakia, formed an alliance known as the Little Entente. This was a mutual defense pact, saying that if any of the three states were in need of assistance in an unprovoked attack by Hungary, the others were now bound to come to their aid and defense. They would also act as a team and cooperate together in foreign policy towards Hungary. Basically, a Balkanado before NATO was even cool. They actually proved effective when in March 1921, Hungary fucked around and found out. The Emperor of Austria, Charles I, left Switzerland to reclaim the Hungarian throne. Neither Horti Miklos, the then region of Hungary, nor the 
Little Entente approved. So Charles left, only to come back seven months later, having gained the support of a good sized chunk of the army. The Little Entente was less than pleased by this development and mobilized its armies and threatened imminent military action mere two years after he already beat the living shit out of the country in the Romanian Hungarian War, which prompted Hungary to arrest the emperor and put an end to the Habsburgs once and for all. Thus, as a result, the two countries established each other as indispensable allies. Together they suffered from the same hand and together they were able to bite it. Fifteen years later, those Pastic Schnitz leaders once more became a major power despite the Treaty of Versailles, this time under the leadership of a different Austrian Tard. Although previous cases of retardation in the rulers of Austria prevented them from ruling properly, this case prevented him from joining art school. Thus in a huge effort of overcompensation for his rejection, the new Austrian ruler attempted to repaint the map, which made Yugoslavia's territory partitioned between Germany, Hungary, Bulgaria, Croatia and Italy. Although Romania was in the same faction as the previously mentioned countries who partitioned Yugoslavia and Serbia by extent, Romania refused to participate in a division, despite being invited to by Germany, which is still brought up by Serbs quite often. After World War II, Romania despite falling under the Eastern Bloc and sharing the same ideology as then Yugoslavia wasn't allowed to communicate with the country due to the 1948 Tito-Stalin split. However, once Czechoslovakia was invaded in 1968, Romania thought it a good idea to strengthen its relationship with non-Eastern Bloc countries, and relations once more were re-established. Yugoslavia was more wealthy and had a more open economy that traded with the West compared to Romania's. Alongside that, it also had open borders with the most countries tainted by evil capitalism. Because of this, many Romanians would smuggle things from Yugoslavia into Romania because it was easier and it was a socialist country but more open than the others. And many goods that were available in Yugoslavia were basically non-existent in Romania, such as movie and music tapes, blue jeans, electronics and different foods. A large part of these smuggling operations happened in the shared region of Banat. Even today, in Romanian Banat, a large number of Romanians know Serbian because of the smuggling. Alongside that, they were able to catch TV and radio frequencies from Yugoslavia, who had more TV stations and channels. Thus, a very positive picture of Serbia was painted in the minds of many Romanians. But by far the most precious cargo traded was actual human beings. Romanians, desperate to escape their communist hellhole, would attempt dangerous crossings into neighboring states, making the Romanian border one of the bloodiest and most dangerous dangerous in Europe during the Cold War. One Yugoslav newspaper estimated that around 4,000 Romanians were killed in 1989 trying to cross into Yugoslavia. One of the ways they'd attempt to cross into Yugoslavia was to swim or boat the Danube River, and far too many did not succeed. Today there are some small cemeteries on the Serbian side, composed of anonymous drowned bodies that washed ashore. As for those who did make it ashore, their best bet was to avoid the Yugoslavian border guards, some of which were happy to send them back. Even so, many of the local Serbs helped the Romanian escapees by hiding them and even transporting them to Belgrade and then up to Austria. The actions of whom garnered continually positive relations between the people all along the border. As this is the Balkans, no one is allowed to have a good time. And soon Yugoslavia broke up. The Bosnian War came along and famously Romania and Serbia's friendship began to fracture a bit due to Romania allowing NATO airplanes on their way to bomb to Serbia to fly over its air space to secure its future acceptance into the EU. This action by the Romanian government was seen by many Romanians as a betrayal of friendship, and many protests erupted in Romania as a result. However, despite NATO airplanes being allowed to fly over Romanian airspace, the Romanian government secretly defied the United Nations sanctions by supplying tens of thousands of tons of fuel and weapons to the Serbs in direct violation of the embargo, using assistance from the highest authorities in Romania, such as the police, Ministry of Transport, the Agricultural Ministry, the Border Police, and the Romanian intelligence service. The underground pipeline was used to transport 38,000 tons of diesel and 8,000 tons of gasoline from a Timisoara refinery to the Danube River port of Panchevo over the course of 18 months. Romania was also able to make this up to the Serbs somewhat by giving them what they wanted the most in the world, the continued denial of Kosovo's existence. Nowadays, while Romania and Serbia don't engage in all-out love and slobberfest, that is, say, Serbia and Greece, or Hungary and Poland, this is a more quiet, understated, but still very strong and stable friendship. They prove that it's not the volume of the affection that counts, 
It's the enduringness and stability that truly matters. Romania is one of Serbia's strongest supporters of its eventual EU accession and willingly acts as its mentor in trying to lead them through the process. The Serbs, on the other hand, see the Romanians as their one true friends in the region. Although they do make fun of them here and there, they always know that there's one country that will stand by them and vice versa. May their good neighborly relations forever keep on blooming. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did and wish to see more, click that subscribe button and become a member like these lovely people. Otherwise, you can go to the ironicshop.com and buy a shirt to support the channel. All the fan funding helps in keeping the channel going. My name is Janos and you've watched Living Ironically in Europe. Hey, hey.